recurring theme here at SC11 has been the path to exascale computing, whether it's possible by 2018, and if so, within what power constraints. As computer simulations become more and more complex, we are able to mimic nature much more accurately. And really to be able to do that, to continuously improve our models of nature, we need ever larger systems. A really good example is actually the H1N1 simulation that researchers from the Chinese Academy of Sciences just did. And essentially, for the first time, they were able to model a whole H1N1 virus. Now, they've only been able to model the virus. What about modeling the drug interaction with the virus? Or modeling how that virus, uh, you know, a, a longer lifetime in that virus's life? That requires exascale computers. The big discussion with exascale, which is, you know, a thousand times more powerful than our current petaflop machines, uh, is that the technology, the way we're going to be building machines in the future is different. And when you're starting to talk about exascale, it's really, uh, you know, hardware performance. And there's obviously a host of software issues, but from the hardware side, it's really about power consumption and how do you drive down uh, both your idle power and your dynamic power that you're using while computing. And, and the idle power, the static power, is particularly important because as we're looking at integrating more and more into a single transistor along with Moore's law, the leakage will shoot up unless we do something you know, dramatic to take care of that. Really one of the biggest challenges in exascale is about the power usage. Right? We could build, if a customer had enough money, an exascale system today, but it would require a gigawatt of power. That's equivalent to all of the output of Hoover Dam just to run the supercomputer. Uh, as these systems are becoming bigger and bigger, we don't have the ability to give enough power to them. Right? We're talking about today the largest systems consuming 10 megawatts, which is pretty much the power of a small town. So as defined by the U.S. Department of Energy, their targets is to build an exascale system for 20 megawatts of power. So that's really our, our big challenge. And so that really, if you think about it, the challenge in that time frame is not about the floating point operations in powering that. Today, if you look at an Intel chip or an NVIDIA chip, most of the power goes into the floating point operations. By the end of the decade, in exascale, the real challenge, the power usage, what becomes expensive, is the data movement. So in fact, you have to think about the flops becoming free, and the data movement is what you pay for. Today, the vision of how we get to exascale is by harnessing just a, a, a truly staggering number of machines, number of, of resources, uh, amounts of memory, those kinds of things. And today, we know how to make some of those systems individually reliable, but but when you get to exascale and you get to the numbers of machines that we're talking about, uh, reliability becomes a, a challenge. It becomes nearly impossible to keep the whole cluster up long enough to actually get you an answer. That you need so many pieces to come together to make an exascale system work. You need technologies in memory. You need technologies in power efficiency. You need uh, reliability. If, if, a, if a computer has a million parts, those parts have to remain reliable for long periods of time, or you have to have software that's so intelligent that it can detect when a component is about to fail and make it so that that, that piece doesn't affect your scientific program from running. It can actually survive the failure of devices. Resiliency or reliability of very large-scale systems so that as you have more and more components in the system to give you that total capa compute capacity, memory, storage, interconnect, processors, and all the, the elements that go into that system, how are they going to be reliable enough to have the system up and running? And includes multiple individual technology areas that have to have had innovations, significant innovations pumped into them to address these challenges. So we're investing in a number of technologies for exascale, which are core technologies out of HP Labs. And just two examples of those are a photonics switching technology, because today when you build a supercomputer, you use optical cables to connect between the different racks of supercomputers. By the end of the decade, with exascale, you'll be bringing photonics into the chassis and actually into the chip itself. 
if you can bring the memory very close to the processor. Today, if you open up a, 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 a desktop PC, you see memory dims, and they're a few inches away from the processor. If we can bring those dims and really bring them close to the processor, you can increase your density. You don't waste energy by sending electrical signals across wires that are a couple of inches long, and it becomes more energy efficient. But again, all of those are technologies that are just beginning to come into play, and only will reach maturity toward the end of the decade. But perhaps just as daunting, if not more, is the challenge of parallelizing software. How do you build applications that can take advantage of this scale of resources? Billions of threads, millions of cores. How do you scale these applications? How do you write them? How do you debug them? How do you make sure that you have optimal performance? It's, it's almost a race between uh, not only the United States, but globally there's a race on to build an exaflop machine before the end of the decade within 20 megawatts. Very much like the space race, where we, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy promised that we would put a man on the moon and bring him back before the end of the decade. While the challenges on the way to achieving exascale computing are numerous and significant, the supercomputing industry is unanimous in its determination to reach its next milestone sooner rather than later. This is Sylvie Barak, EE Times, SC11.